Hi, this is Nolan. I'm with uh, Casey Roberts at Robertson. Um, this is postproduction.com. Um, and uh, actually, I think we just went live here, so I'll redo it. Um, this is Nolan with postproduction.com, and I am here today with uh, film composer uh, Casey Robertson, and he's all the way in from uh, Toronto. And uh, so we're definitely really excited to have him on the show. And we were having a pre-show discussion and kind of talking about different uh, techniques, kind of two different camps that people are kind of falling into. Um, but uh, with no further to do here, Casey, welcome to the show. We're definitely excited to have you on. How, how are you doing out there in Toronto? Yeah, I'm doing great. And uh, really glad to be here today. Great day here in Toronto. And uh, yeah, very, very happy to be part of this discussion. Yeah, well, I see you wearing a hat and a jacket. Is it cold, or is that just part of your, uh, your style? Well, I, <laughs> I just moved, just moved in here, and uh, I've had the air conditioner on all day, and uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> it, it cooled down a little more than I thought it would. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> so I guess the question begs to be asked: um, Are you? Uh, why don't you just take off your your jacket if it's it's hot outside, but you got the air on inside? Or <laughs> <laughs> I sort of. Adjusting a little, it may take a it may take a few minutes. I, uh, <laughs> I I always underestimate how these things are are gonna go. And I just moved in here last night, and I'm still trying to figure out how to operate my air conditioner, and uh, not sure which windows to open, which to close, and <laughs> it's all it's all new to me over here. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Casey, I'm from Wisconsin originally, so I, I know that cold, hot, weird, you know, should I put on a jacket? Should I wear a t-shirt? <laughs> so anyways, well, we're definitely excited to have you on the show. So um, let me ask you a little bit more about you, I guess, before we kind of get into the conversation. What? Uh, tell me a little bit about your background. I know you studied music at a really young age, if I'm not mistaken, and got a degree quite early on and kind of went from there, guitar player, teacher maybe as well. What? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Casey. Yeah, well, I started off playing uh, guitar. I started when I was about 12 years old and I, uh, I studied with a couple um, Toronto area based musicians. I, I studied with John Yates and uh, Walt Young who uh, did a lot of touring. He was actually originally from Cleveland so he was tied in with a lot of the scene down there and I, I learned a lot of really interesting things. They, they were very much uh, what you would say uh, sort of traditional rock blues players. So I, I studied with them uh, throughout my years as a teenager. Then I uh, attended Carleton University and uh, I studied music but I also did it through what they called their sonic design program. So there's a huge emphasis in new media. So um, studying the work of experimental composers like uh, John Cage, looking into the work of people like Carl Heinz Stockhouse and Milton Babbitt. So, um, when I studied music at, at the undergraduate level, there was a real diversity of things that I had never even seen before. A lot of it was electronic music, and that's kind of what got me into film composing and composition to begin with. Wow. That's, so um, so you, you kind of came in on, is it, on the digital side then. Was there any, what was it that grabbed you and grabbed your attention and uh, pulled you into using the digital side versus maybe the other side of uh, the more traditional side of things. Was well, there anything that really led you into that? The one thing I found was that part of it was accessibility. And in the original days, when they developed the uh, Princeton Columbia Mark II synthesizer, only essentially <laughs> the most, uh, you know, what would you say, most skilled, most, um, exclusive group could access that synthesizer, and it, it, it actually was probably about two or three times the size of my apartment here. And <laughs> yeah. it had these punch cards, and it was just really ultra complicated, and only a very, very select few could use it. So electronic music was very much out of the hands of someone like myself, but um, especially in the last decade, computer technology has gone down in price, digital audio workstations, and I just find it's very accessible. I can sit down, I can sequence everything, program everything, and I can really uh, essentially get everything down what I want. And at the same time, I don't have to worry. I know some of the people I attended school with were very traditional composers, and uh -huh. for them, they'd have to write everything out and then find someone to play it. And often, finding people to play it is a challenge, especially if 
they don't want to do it for free, and you're a struggling <laughs> composer too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I remember um, back. You know, it's kind of funny. It sounds like this was a long, long time ago, but really, it wasn't that long ago that even a sampler would cost uh, a fortune. And uh, now, of course, you can samplers come free on your iPhone or your whatever you're you're using. So, um, so I guess, do you think it's maybe more that the people who are going for the traditional uh, composing, do you think that that's just because they feel more comfortable with that? Um, and then, do you think they would shift to I mean, do they do they not cross over at all? I just can't imagine not doing that. Or, or you tell I me. Think, <laughs> I think especially now they're crossing over more and more because I, I know um, back in the day I, I used to get some of the more traditional people that would sometimes they they contact me and they'd say I'd like to record one of my compositions. What do I need? And I said, well, to do it well, to actually record even a small quintet or quartet, you're going to need some pretty decent equipment. You're going to need an acoustically treated room. So then when I say you could use a, a symphonic orchestra, the virtual instruments in that, all of a sudden uh, it sounds a lot more appealing. And sure. some of the people that were very hesitant to even put their foot in the door there are realizing, well, here's a way that uh, you don't have to be John Williams with the big budget and the resources. You could be a, a fairly modest person that does this on their spare time and you could still get something that sounds uh, quite quite decent in terms of quality and things have changed a lot in the, the last 10 years because uh, before um, PCs could handle all the synthesis and processing um, you, you just you couldn't get those quality samples but now um, I know even with people they go out and buy synthesizer sample packs for a hundred dollars they sound as good as some of the um, old synthesizers in the 80s and 90s that people were paying two or three thousand dollars. Oh, sure, sure. So, so do you think it's really more a, a case of, uh, say, a, a purist, somebody who's composing, and they say, hey, I'm, I'm a purist, I like to compose, and then I hand it off to somebody else? Because I can totally see your point in the sense that the affordability of, of going digital, I mean, I, I guess I don't know enough about the composer world like like you do, um, but I would think that nowadays everybody would start off, like, even if you're a purist, I would think you'd start off on a digital keyboard maybe, where I guess, I suppose everybody has their own way they do things. And, I, I think uh, there's, a definitely, there's definitely a shift, I think, and even some of the people I met in the old days that weren't really into that, they're starting to realize they can still really do they can even be a fairly traditional composer and still emphasize and use all these uh, technology advancements. And I think that's definitely, they don't have to be as sort of out there and experimental as I may be, but they can still, they can still definitely make use of it. And I, I think people are starting to really get excited about all these advancements, especially in the last decade. Sure. You know, um, I know some people here in LA that they're really getting into kind of the, the analog side of things and so they're going out and really looking for um, that old gear and they swear that there's a, a you know an audio difference well, what do you what are your thoughts on on that you know should somebody go out and seek out those classic tube amps and I guess this may not be necessarily on the composer side this is maybe more on the production side but I guess it could be the same but so I guess maybe translating this into a composer question should someone you know go out and seek those analog type sounds or do you really believe that there's absolutely no difference <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe I believe what we have now is really good. It all depends too. I, I know in, in terms of uh, um, I, I have a number of different bands on different projects, and I will only use and record with a traditional tube amplifier, um, both entirely okay. tube preamp, tube power amp, and I own all the other other type of things too. I, I only line six interface that has all the different digital settings and I I think it's actually quite good but um, since I have sort of what they model those after I just I guess I I might even be a bit of a traditionalist there I, I, I've been <laughs> hesitant to jump on board with guitar but I, I find at the same time, though, I've been quite impressed with, uh, for example, I, I own some of the uh, modern 
uh, Korg synthesizers. I have the micro Korg that's modeled after sort of a mini Moog of the uh, the 70s or 80s, and I've been very impressed with it. And I, I suppose there there probably is some level of, of difference. I may not be um, I may not have the same ear for synthesizers that I do for a guitar, so that may be why I I tolerate the the digital. Uh, but at the same time, though, um, I know uh, they've modeled, for example, a lot of the modern synthesizers off some of the old Oberheim ones of the 80s. And I, I think um, Rush and Van Halen used to take two or three of these things on the road because they just die or quit or something was <laughs> short inside. And um, the, the vintage stuff is great, but some of it's just uh, especially... 20, 30 years down the road, there's so many things that could go wrong. Right. Um, when you have something that sounds pretty close or almost as close that's entirely digital or a soft synth, a lot of people will say, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just going to use that. But I mean, I, I can see the appeal in using the original thing and, uh, and, and, and sometimes just the fact that they're not digital, that they're analog, there's maybe more variants in the sound. They try to enter in that into the engineering equations and the uh, maybe the equations they use to develop these sounds in, in the modern context. But sometimes people say, yeah, it's it's just the vintage just has that feel or that sound. So it's really hard to argue with it, but definitely uh, what we have now is a lot more impressive than what we did, say, 15 or 20 years ago in terms of recreating that digitally. Oh, yeah, definitely, and uh, quality's gotten better, sound's gotten better, price has gotten a lot better as well, um, and I know that, it, let's kind of shift gears a little bit, because we were talking in the pre-show a little bit about um, the two camps of people, the traditional and then maybe more of the uh, non-traditional, would it be? Um, and I, th I already know what your background is, but just for the sake of the, the viewers, What's your your process that you use when you're composing something for a for a film score? What uh, what's the process you get into? Maybe some of the different uh, gear that you use, or or how do you how do you set up your your process there? Well, basically, uh, in most cases, what I'll do is I'll I'll take whatever it be, whether it be a, a documentary or or the footage, and I, I I take a number of different ways. I may sometimes I'll I'll sit down and I'll work it out on a piano which is fairly traditional, but then I'll mix it with, I'll, I'll plug everything into Cubase. So I, I do all of my recording through Cubase. So um, I'll add in different synthesizers, or I may take the same idea and then recreate it digitally. I might do some layering, and then at the same time, I might drop in some uh, recorded sounds. And just sort of, I try not to have any fixed rules. I, I try to... Um, just think what would fit here. And I mean, sometimes a very melodic line will fit in a particular case, but uh, sometimes I've seen some very effective scoring where it's it's just uh, ambient sounds or pulses, and really I, I find uh, it, it's a case of just sort of um, trying to find what fits in that particular scene. So I have really, really no fixed criteria on, on how I'm going to approach the task, but um, I, I find just, especially, I, I find with Cubase just having a vast array of sounds, I can experiment, and eventually, usually, I find that tone or that uh, sequence that I think is going to be appropriate and fits. Huh. So, um, it sounds to me, then, that your process that you're using, it's really just more of a natural process. You're not necessarily in one camp or the other. You're just kind of thinking, what works? I got to get the right sound. I don't care how I get it. <laughs> I just got to get the sound. Yeah, you got to play around the, with it until you find something. Yeah, and there are different, different, and I think uh, at times you can combine. You can combine traditional notation with experimental notation, and I think it, it can be a. Uh, it, 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 there's a, a lot of uh, there's a lot of room to play with, and uh, that's that's basically uh, what I aim to do. I try to mix everything together and uh, it's one of those things where going in you, you never know what you're going to come out with. So, sometimes someone will say I'd like it to sound like this and you can try to sort of work within that that framework 
but then you might come up with something and this is totally different and you give them the two pieces of music and they'll say, oh, I actually like the second one better. So um, it's one of those things where you just sort of sit down. It's, it's, it's a fairly natural process and yeah, I even though I I may be uh, on the experimental side, if I find something that's uh, tonal or more melodic that fits, I, I I try to incorporate that into the mix too. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about that real quick. You said you're more on the experimental side, so um, what? Let's say somebody who is not on the experimental side, what's their process? I guess sort of the antithesis of yourself. What would that look like? Well, um, some of the people I know that might be more traditional, they might uh, sit down with, uh, for example, uh, scoring software. There's different types of scoring software. They might um, write out the notes, the notation for each instrument, and then um, sort of when it all comes together, they have each part essentially laid out. It depends on how many instruments the orchestration's for. And uh, at the same time, um, they they would probably be trying to fit everything together nicely to get um, sort of a nice flow or uh, harmonic orchestration for the piece. So um, it, it's one of those cases where if they're doing it for traditional instruments, um, throwing in, let's say, a, an old Oberheim synth or uh, electronic drum beat, it would just, uh, in some cases, for some composers, that might sound a little off, a little different. But um, at the same time, uh, sometimes throwing in something a little out of the element can be good too. But uh, um, I, I find, yeah, often the some of the more traditional composers, one of the big differences is they may actually sit down and write things out as opposed to just... Um, punching things in, mixing, matching, um, playing with all the knobs and the tones. And, and uh, I think maybe, maybe one of the, the, the main premises is uh, if you're experimental, you may be playing more with the timbre of the sounds. Uh -huh. Whereas uh, if, if you were doing it for a more traditional route, you might be more concerned with orchestration because you have all these different instruments, specific instruments and sort of setups to uh, write for. Huh. So it seems like then maybe more the, the traditional uh, aspect of composing might be more kind of step by step, you know, kind of outlined, maybe a little bit more organized. I'm kind of picturing, I don't, I don't want to say Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but you know, kind of like where you've got somebody who's yeah. just like, you know, <laughs> methodically going through, it's kind of like when they sit down to write music, it's pretty much the same process every single time they follow a recipe, whereas maybe the non-traditional or experimental composer, you might just, you know, get an idea of what you're going for and then just start, you know, I don't want to say going crazy, but just trying all kinds of different things, mixing, matching. Is there any method to the madness or is it uh, just it, it really, your ear? <laughs> um, it, it really uh, changes. I, I know sometimes I just sat down and hit record and um, sort of set my parameters and played something on the spot. And there's been really no writing out. Other times I, I have written things out traditionally and then recorded the extra electronic sounds over top. So I, I find with me there, there's real no sort of fixed method. It's it, it sort of, I, I find every project I have to hit it from a different angle or try something new. Otherwise I, I think all the music might, for me, ended up sounding the same and just slightly different here and there. So um, I, I find it's, it's one of those things where every every project has to be taken a little differently. And I think, yeah, I think um, there's, it, when you're doing maybe things from an electronic or a uh, experimental standpoint, there's a lot more emphasis on recording and sampling and um, basically using uh, computer sequencing than there is writing things out in sort of the pre-planned, sort of laid out step-by-step -step, uh, process. So um, both of them definitely have their merits. And I think, as I was saying earlier, often some of the most interesting scores I've seen is when people combine the two, for example, in 
I, I always was a big fan of the soundtrack Wendy Carlos did for uh, Clockwork Orange because oh. um, extremely talented uh, keyboard player, but also um, uh, very brilliant in terms of synthesis. I think she had a master's degree in uh, physics or something. So uh, when she worked with Robert Moog to develop all these different sounds, there was equally, if not as much emphasis in just developing the timbre and the tones of those sounds and uh, experimenting with just the sound itself as there was in terms of the playing and the writing out and uh, sequencing of the music. So I, I always found, for example, that to be a very fascinating crossover soundtrack. Sure. Do they ever, Casey, is there a case where maybe um, a producer, they need a film score, you know, they need a composer to come in and do some work. Um, do you ever find that they would ask you, hey, are you more traditional or are you more experimental? Or do they just say, hey, we want this type sound, we like the way you sound, so we want you. <laughs> is any of that dictated by the, the production or is that more just get the job done and we like the sound? Well, I've had at times, I've had uh, people say, oh, um, I think I might just use this particular piece for this. And sometimes it's actually been um, pre-written, so they just say, "Oh, I, I like this this particular uh, composition you did." And sometimes they'll say, "You really think that's the right fit?" And I might maybe uh, show them something else, and then let them take it from there. But uh, usually, uh, people say, uh, "This is sort of the general sound I want," or what they'll do often is they'll they'll give you what they call a bed track, sort of a temporary track. They might oh, take sure. sound from a different movie. And, uh, yeah, these days I don't think um, people tend to ask as much which camp you, you lie in, unless it's they have something very, very specific in mind. But I find most times, rather than the type of music, there it's necessarily the sound. Or they'll say, I like this composer style or the soundtrack from this movie can do something like this. And um, the thing is, too, uh, not all people that may be directing the, uh, the production, they might not be able to necessarily verbalize the genre or the type of sort of scoring they want. But usually they know when, when they hear it. They can say, for example, I like the soundtrack from this, I like this sound. So usually... Um, they're, they're able to get the point across. Just, it, it might be different kind of musician as opposed to a Oh, sure, sure. What, uh, Casey, what do you think somebody who is more on the traditional side of composing, what do they say to somebody who's like you who's more on the experimental side of composing? Well, um, as I said, in, in the past, uh, I, I found there is a big separation. And even... Um, uh, where where I studied uh, study music, they I don't even think they have that area of study anymore. I think they've gone more back to the traditional route. So huh. it, it, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's sort of I, I find there, there's sort of uh, it comes and goes in terms of what what people are are interested in. But I I I do think that um, these days now even people from that more traditional realm are really starting to sort of tap into what I guess sequencing has to offer because I've noticed even in the group there are a lot of um, people that might fit in the more traditional realm but they're definitely starting to use the same software that I've, I've been using so oh. I, I do think that they are starting to move into this digital realm maybe necessarily using as radical of sounds. I think there is they are really starting to merge into the into the digital field. I think almost today if, if you're an independent composer, I think you almost have to these days. Sure. But you know in case you know in talking with you it sounds like there's almost like a division not a division, but almost like two different types of camps. There's A, the the way you compose, whether you're doing it traditional or experimental, meaning you've got it very structured and very outlined and you kind of are following a method um, versus someone who is on the experimental side maybe doing more of, 
you know, start a, starting off with an idea, tweaking a knob here, check out this, dial this there, and kind of come up with something, an organism of sorts. But in addition to that, it sounds like there's some that use more of the digital composing, maybe like you do, and all of the synthesizers and all the different ways that you can come up with that. And then there might be others who are using the more traditional instruments in their composing process. Is that an, a correct assessment of, of kind of, you know, the compo the composer's world? Yeah, it's sort of, um, I find uh, these days it's kind of moving in a multiplicity of, of directions. And I, I think things are starting uh -huh. to break down a little in, in terms of uh, division. Like, I, I, I do... Um, I do know there are people that, that still uh, prefer to keep things sort of A and B, but um, I'm finding even people I knew a number of years ago, they're, they're starting to really um, get excited about when, when they hear what you can have in, in synthesis. So, um, yeah, and I, and I think uh, software is allowing us to do a little more. So I, I think that, um, that there's a lot of... Crossover. It's really hard to say where things will go in the future. And I know, um, I, I I remember I, I read a, a couple of textbooks where some people were criticizing actually how things have been moving because they said now anyone can make uh, digital music. But I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I, I think it's it's sort of like the the Gutenberg press. It it opens up. There's going to be a a lot of stuff people are creating. Some of it's not going to be good, but there's probably going to be a lot more. Um, even better things now that sort of the cost factors down and essentially anyone can go out and, and produce music. Yeah, well, interestingly enough, Casey, I just had a discussion with a photographer kind of about this this very similar discussion where it was kind of like now that everybody has an iPhone or you know Android or whatever it is, everybody has a camera, everybody can shoot. So they were thinking, oh, shoot, well, maybe there'll be less, you know, professional work available because why are you going to hire somebody to come to your event to take pictures? And actually what seemingly is happening is kind of the opposite because everybody can take pictures. More people are beginning to understand that, hey, you got to be, you have to have a skill. <laughs> uh, you might have yeah. a camera that doesn't make you a photographer. So if the event is important, and in this case, if the composition is important, if you've got a piece that needs to sound great, yeah, you know, uh, sure, you, everybody can record, but does that mean they can actually produce something that's worthy of a project? <laughs> so, yeah, and it really, it, it really does start to show too, because I mean, uh, it, it, it's great to give everyone access, but uh, I mean, there are definitely people that will stand out as being a really good composer or a really good producer, as we see uh, um, someone that. Uh, my friends that are professional photographers, their pictures turn out a, a lot better than whatever I take on my BlackBerry. It uh, is so blurred, sometimes you can't tell who is who. So, um, <laughs> yeah, there, there's definitely, it, and people develop a skill, they, they develop their passion for it. And I do think that, um, I, I think sort of the what's good about having all this cheap technology is it allows people to get that start. And then from there they can move forward, whereas, as I was saying, uh, uh, 60 years ago, uh, only sort of the uh, Ivy Tower elite could go in that giant room and punch in their cards and make their uh, electronic compositions. So I, I think just the fact that um, it, it's sort of open, opening it up, it's, it's making almost the system more democratic. People can just make music, they can uh, create all sorts of different things, and uh, some of it some of it uh, may not be terribly great, but uh, <laughs> sometimes there's some really, uh, really amazing stuff that, that comes out of the least likely places. So uh, I, I do think it's it's great that things are opening up and that accessibility is really starting to come into play too. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's definitely cool. Um, so now I know you you have a couple things that you do. Um, you've got a, a a great Facebook group. You also have uh, your online presence. Um, tell us a little bit more, I guess, about what uh, something you'd like to promote about what what you're doing, um, you know, in, in your life with your website, your Facebook page, or whatever else you have going on. Sure. Um, well, people uh, they can uh, definitely check out the group. The group has uh, really been growing. It's it's it has I think over 7,500 members now, and so the uh, film scoring uh, network for composers and filmmakers on on Facebook, and they can find all this through my website, which is 
CaseyRobertson.net, and they can also see updates. I I do various uh, concerts here and there. Uh, I do a lot of benefit concerts for human rights work, so uh, I'm usually up to something, and they can just log on to my website and sort of see what the, the latest uh, project is that I'm, I'm working on. So all, always something going on. <laughs> okay, so if they want to find out more about w what's happening in your life, they can go to CaseyRobertson.net, and if they're a film composer um, or scorer, then they can go and maybe join your, your Facebook group. And and what's the, the exact purpose? Why, when you started that group, what, what did you have in mind for it to become? Well, uh, it's funny. When I started it, it, it was uh, fairly small. And uh, what I wanted to do was uh, I, I do a lot of nonprofit work with trying to connect um, different groups to get different projects going. And I find that... Uh, Social media is sort of the place now, especially on Facebook, where people go to connect with other people. So I figured, well, um, I've always wanted to get involved with different people in the community of, of uh, filmmaking and, and scoring, but it, it's sort of sometimes hard. You, you don't really find people on Craigslist or Kijiji for this. So I thought, well, this is there's a lot of people I meet involved in sort of artistic community. So I thought, let's start this group and see what happens. And initially it started off pretty slow. And then one day, just 50 people requested to join a day. And then it just literally almost, it, it just blew up and almost, well, not, not quite exponentially, but it, it, it literally, uh, within, I think, uh, a year or so, doubled in size. So it just really blew up. And uh, people really uh, seemed to find it good. What, what they like to do in this group is you have some very experienced people. Um, we have some professional composers that display their work, but then we have some people that are just starting out. So they might, I, I've seen a, a number of people, they go on the group and they say, uh, what do you think about this? And people may say, great work, but refine the timber, maybe change the melody line. And it, it's, it's a place where people can get feedback because, I mean, we can all show our work to our friends, mm -hmm. and <laughs> if they have sort of a casual um, relationship with it, they'll say, yeah, it's fine. Yep. Like they're, they're not going to critique <laughs> it, so to speak. So it's, it's a good place to get your work critiqued and also to connect. And uh, we, we see people that will say, okay, I need this project uh, scored. Is there anyone that can help out? And, and a lot of people, when they're just starting out, they're willing to either work and just work for credit or uh, for minimal cost. So it's a good way for a lot of people to get the ball rolling on, on various projects. And um, I, I know networking is, is important. And my, my sister makes a documentary film. So uh, I, I've seen through her experience, uh, it's really important to get out there to meet people and just uh, connect with uh, just about anyone you can. Because you never, you never know where an opportunity is going to come up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I guess the key is you just got to be there so that when the opportunity comes up, you're there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I find in this group it keeps uh, growing and expanding. And uh, it's one of those things you, you never – we have people from so many different countries that join it. And you, you never know. You could post something and someone is going to say, oh, someone might come on and say, I love that piece. Let's work together. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, opportunity is one of those things that comes at the most random of places. <laughs> and the name of that group again, Casey, is? It's the Film Scoring Network for Composers and Filmmakers. And actually, if they uh, go to my, my website, there's a link to it. So they can just be instantly uh, directed. Oh, so that. the yeah. easiest thing to do then is just go to CaseyRobertson.net. Yeah, and that will, uh, there's a link there, and uh, that will direct them uh, right to the group, and then they can just request to join, and uh, I'll approve them. And then they can post whatever they like and all sorts of uh, interesting stuff on there to see. Nice, nice. Well, great, Casey. Um, I guess in parting, do um, you got anything hot that you're working on, or is something in the, the pipeline, or you sign non-disclosures? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, just working on... Uh, some uh, just various uh, oh, different projects with uh, some some local artists at the moment. But uh, um, I'm actually, I just moved downtown, so I'm hoping to uh, sort of 
get settled in here and uh, set up my studio uh, if I have space for it here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Right, right now I, I'm actually just uh, I've been doing a lot of research into musicology, so I've been uh, I, I'm just finishing off my master's thesis. So that's sort of been really sort of over my head. So once that's done, there's going to be a lot more music making. So <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, that's great. Well, I'll tell you what, Casey, I know that uh, as we were setting up the interview, uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, what we do here at postproduction.com, but want to let you know that you're more than welcome to get a free listing on the site, um, and uh, we have a directory there for uh, film composers, musicians, guitar players, drummers, bass, singers, everything. Um, so we can chat a little bit about that uh, down the line. But yeah, we'd be more than happy to, to help you and your group out with that as well and uh, definitely really really excited to have you on the show here and I, and I know that uh, we're going to continue the conversation maybe with somebody who's a little bit more on the traditional side of things and then we're looking to maybe do a roundup um, of people with different backgrounds you know whether it be traditional or more experimental like yourself and maybe put together a panel um, and uh, see what kind of sparks fly <laughs> if any but it kind of sounds to me as if it's really like people are more open to hey let's just get the job done and how we get started in that process may differ, but at the end of the day, as long as the person's happy with the music, you know, you've accomplished the mission, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, a great score is a great score, and, and I think that's the bottom line. Yeah, yeah. And that sort of process uh, <laughs> long <laughs> gets, gets to that end point. So, yeah, it, it, as long as it's a, a good score, a good piece of music, I think everyone's happy. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely have to agree. Well. Casey, again, thanks for being on the show. Definitely enjoyed having you here and uh, absolutely look forward to seeing your group grow on Facebook. And um, again, anybody who wants to find out about that group or more about Casey, go to caseyrobertson.net and all of the links are there. You can connect with him. Um, if you want to get your free listing on postproduction.com, you can come to postproduction.com and uh, the, the listing is, is uh, easily accessible there as well. Um, and Casey, unless you have anything else you want to add on the show here, um, feel free or we will see you very soon. Yeah, that had a great time. Yeah, great idea here and uh, really happy to be a part of this. Great, great. Well, Casey, again, thank you so much for coming on the show and for your time and we will uh, talk with you soon. Great, thanks so much. All right, talk to you later. Thanks.